Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this critical discussion on health equity and pancreatic cancer research in honor of Juneteenth. Well, I'm sure you've all heard that Juneteenth is now a federal holiday. And while Dr. King said the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice, that doesn't mean we don't have to do the work to make that happen. happen. I'm honored you have all joined us to recognize the power of this momentous day and commitment to understanding the importance of diversity in pancreatic cancer research and equity in the treatment of pancreatic cancer. Before we dive in though, let me tell you about our next webinar coming up in just two weeks, Lust Garden Live, our quarterly series of in-depth research updates. You won't wanna miss the next one at noon, Wednesday, June 30th. Dr. Tuvison, whom you'll meet in just a moment, will be back along with his colleague, Dr. Dennis Planker in Northwell Health, Dr. Wasif Saif, will have a behind the scenes tour of the organoid lab at Cold Spring Harbor. And just a few housekeeping issues. You're welcome to ask your questions during the Q&A at any time during this session. We'll answer as many, as many as we can at the end. We are recording this session and you'll be able to rewatch any portion on our YouTube channel though it may take a few, a few days for us to upload it. The chat feature is disabled. To ask a question, simply click the Q&A button just left of center on the menu at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you don't see a menu, scroll your cursor over the Zoom window and it should pop up. We will be live tweeting on our Twitter account. You can follow along and post at Lusgarten FDN Foundation, so Lusgarten FDN or tag us in your posts. You can also use the hashtag BlackFamCan for your post to be part of the first National Black Family Cancer Awareness Week conversation. This is a community initiative by the FDA's Oncology Center of Excellence Project to raise awareness for cancer risk in Black people and African Americans. Today's webinar is sponsored by BMS. I'd like to thank BMS for their commitment to health equity and diversity. Now it's my extreme pleasure to introduce our first presenter, Dr. David Tuvison. Dr. Tuvison is a world-renowned pancreatic cancer researcher and the chief scientist here at the Lusgarten Foundation. Dr. Tuvison is also the director of the Lusgarten Dedicated Pancreatic Cancer Research Lab at Cold Spring Harbor, and especially important in context of today's discussion, the president of the American Association of Cancer Research, or AACR. Hi, Dave. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. And hello, Linda and uh, Avery. I'm, I'm really pleased to uh, be talking to you today on, on our Juneteenth. Uh, we uh, decided as a foundation uh, last year to um, recognize uh, the issue around diversity and pancreas cancer and disparity in pancreas cancer. And this was stimulated by the passing of the late uh, Congressman John Lewis and Supreme Court Justice uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who both died of pancreatic cancer in this past year, as you know. And we uh, decided as a foundation to honor their memories and continue the type of trailblazing work for which these two national icons were known. The result of, of this was um, the formulation of two Lust Garden Foundation, AACR, Career Development Awards for Pancreatic Cancer Research uh, to honor the memories of, of RBG and uh, John Lewis. The competition uh, for these awards uh, was uh, very substantial. Uh, the, the awards were th are three years long and they're $300,000 grants. Um, and fortunately, many, many people across the, the country applied for them. Um, and in this past April, uh, just two months ago, I had the honor of announcing the winners of our first competition at the AACR annual meeting, where we recognized two outstanding early career pancreatic cancer scientists. We know that real progress in uh, pancreas cancer research will only come by having a very rich and diverse field of brilliant researchers who want to do the hard work of solving pancreas cancer. Um, in my AACR presidential comments, I made the point that the one of the fundamental importance of having a diverse workforce is, is we want to attract people who learn to solve problems differently. People who grow up 
in different areas of the world who grow up in different stratas economically of life, they learn to solve the same problem differently. And the scientific and clinical problem of pancreas cancer requires people of different problem solving skills. Um, and so that's why, you know, this is so important uh, what we're talking about here today. So joining us here today uh, to give a talk in recognition of Juneteenth, which is again, as of yesterday, a national holiday is Dr. Avery Posey, uh, who's one of the two inaugural recipients of our award and his award is um, a career development award in honor of Congressman John Lewis. Uh, I've, I've known about Dr. Posey for quite some time as he's had a very illustrious uh, track record at the University of Pennsylvania. And he was recruited as a faculty member at the University of Pennsylvania as an assistant professor of pharmacology at the Perlman School of Medicine in Philadelphia at UPenn. And the project for which he won the award is titled The Role of TN Antigen in Pancreatic Cancer, Driver, Suppressor, and Target. I know uh, Avery is going to regale you with a lot of his brilliant insights to how he got to this point today. And the important thing is, again, going back to what I mentioned, he's learned to solve problems differently than many of us. And that's important because the problem he's tackling right now is fundamental to the genesis and hopefully the therapy of pancreas cancer. So we should give a warm welcome to Avery and look forward to learning from him his scientific insights that will help us unravel new approaches for this disease for patients with pancreas cancer. So welcome, Avery. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, both of you, for having me and for hosting this important conversation about health equity and pancreatic cancer research. Uh, I am going to share my screen with you. Um, but before I actually begin my talk, I, I think I just want to start by introducing myself and telling you a little bit about who I am. So currently, I'm an assistant professor, uh, as, as Dave mentioned, at the University of Pennsylvania Perlman School of Medicine, and I work in the Department of uh, Systems Pharmacology and Translational Therapeutics. Uh, I'm also a member of the Center for Cellular Immunotherapies, and, and that, that title um, provide some insight into what my lab does. We work in a field called cancer immunotherapy. We're interested in the use of T-cell-based uh, adoptive immunotherapies for the treatment of cancer. And you may have heard of a, a type of T-cell-based therapy that's currently FDA approved for B-cell malignancies and multiple myeloma called CAR T-cells. My lab develops CAR T-cells. We are mostly interested in CAR T cells that target solid tumor organs, including pancreatic cancer. And we have an interest in a type of targets called uh, post-translational modifications or glycans that, that can uh, differentiate a tumor uh, from a normal tissue, there, thereby enhancing the safety of, of these types of therapies. We currently have a, a, a phase one clinical trial un, uh, underway, sponsored by a company called T-Immunity Therapeutics, uh, for patients with multiple solid tumors, including pancreatic cancer. Um, <clears throat> notably, my, my lab does not study uh, health disparities. Um, this is not my area of expertise. However, I have a very personal uh, interest in the area of health equity, uh, as well as a budding professional interest in this area as well. Um, and so, so um, uh, excuse me if, if I... Uh, do not fully cover this topic, but I meant to give you a, a, a discussion that I see are important for, um, for achieving health equity in pancreatic cancer treatment and research. Uh, so first I wanna start with some definitions. Um, what, what is health equity? And so I'm using a definition that the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation uh, defined recently, that health equity means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. Uh, this requires removing obstacles to health, such as poverty, discrimination, and their consequences, including powerlessness, lack of access to good jobs with fair pay, quality education, housing, safe environments, and healthcare. Um, and then also I wanted to go through a little bit about why we're here today, which is uh, uh, in, in recognition of tomorrow, uh, Juneteenth. So Juneteenth, officially known now as Juneteenth National Independence Day, uh, historically known as Jubilee Day or Black Independence Day or Emancipation Day, is now a federal holiday that celebrates the emancipation of African-American slaves in the United States. Uh, it commemorates the anniversary date of June 19th, 
1865, which was the date when Union soldiers um, reached Texas, and it's Galveston, Texas, uh, beautiful shores in Galveston, Texas, to proclaim freedom for slaves by enforcing the Emancipation Proclamation that had been signed into law uh, back in 1862 and 63. Um, and I believe that this date gives us a time for reflection on the progress of African Americans in the United States, uh, as well as progress of our, of our overall society towards inclusiveness and equality. Um, and I think it's also important to discuss the timeline or uh, history of uh, African Americans in the United States. Um, so, uh, because I, I think that it's very involved in the, in the concept of health equity and health inequity. Um, so, slavery existed for a large portion of the history of, uh, of this country. Uh, starting from 1565 when the first slaves arrived in Florida, 1619 when first slaves arrived in, in Virginia, all the way until the Civil War uh, that, that ended in 1865. Um, this was a, a time of uh, probably great struggle for African Americans as, as slaves. Um, uh, what we know about slavery was that um, the effects were very brutal um, that uh, the forced labor definitely supported the economic development and growth of our country uh, and provides foundations for uh, the, the, the strong um, economy and country that we have today. But post the Civil War, post freedom or emancipation, uh, it was also not a difficult, not an easy time for African Americans. There was a period of reconstruction in which the country uh, made laudable attempts to establish a real interracial democracy, and that was met with some opposition um, that that severely retracted those um, those freedoms. Um, and what followed was a period of um, segregation, of uh, um, unequal treatment of um, unequal access to federal resources, such as the, the benefits that came with um, housing deals, and uh, the New Deal, um, our, our nation's uh, greatest infrastructure uh, plan, and um, as well as, as terror, racial terror, uh, including uh, an event that we just celebrated the 100th anniversary of, the Tulsa Black Wall Street bombing uh, and massacre, and as well as other massacres. Um, we also know that there was some medical mistreatment, such as the Tuskegee syphilis experiments, which continue to this day to um, discourage um, some African-American participation in, in the medical um, research, uh, as, well as, as well as access to uh, accessing medical care. And post the civil rights movement, um, which was a time in which um, African Americans achieved great strides towards progress, civil rights and voting rights acts were, were um, approved and written into law. Um, but post that, there, there has been a significant attempt towards um, towards equality and towards achieving our country's motto of e pluribus unum, out of many, one, um, with uh, what, what some would see as slow progress, um, but progress to get us to, to today in which we can, I can argue that today is the best day of race relations uh, in our country's history and tomorrow will be even better than that. So we are consistently improving uh, and progressing. But what is, what is that period and that experience done for African-Americans was it's, it's led to differences um, in, in many factors, including health. Um, and, and there are many factors that, that lead to health inequities, but health inequities do exist and health disparities exist. Um, and I, I apologize, I have a slide that will discuss health disparities. Um, I apologize, I'm looking for my definition of health disparities, I must have missed it. Um, but a, in terms of pancreatic cancer, the incidence of pancreatic cancer is um, increased in, in Black individuals when compared to all other uh, races or ethnic groups. 
uh, as you can see in this slide that has data from the SEER statistics uh, for, for men, black men have the highest uh, frequency of pancreatic cancer incidence. So this is new cases di at diagnoses, uh, 17 uh, individuals per 100,000 of that race or ethnicity. For females, it's 14.3 compared to 15 or 11.8 respectively uh, for all races. And the same is true for mortality, uh, that Black individuals have increased mortality when it comes to pancreatic cancer, 15 uh, for males, uh, per 100,000 persons or 12 for females per 100,000 persons. And this is data from uh, the United States from 2014 to 2018, uh, age adjusted. We know that the reasons for some of these inequities in, um, in uh, the increased incidence or increased mortality is due to social and economic and, uh, factors. Uh, that is economic stability, um, the neighborhoods and physical environments that we live in, uh, access to quality education, access to quality food and healthy options, um, the communities and systems that uh, we have to support us, as well as uh, access to healthcare. So access to um, uh, healthcare that's of quality, uh, large academic medical institutions, uh, distance from and ability to travel to um, institutions that would have quality health care. Uh, and all of these factors combined can uh, lead to differences in mortality, morbidity, life expectancy, um, health care uh, outcomes. Um, and for, for pancreatic cancer, we know that there are certain lifestyle factors that contribute to, um, to an increased risk of uh, pancreatic cancer and increased incidence in, in African Americans. Obesity is one of the lifestyle factors associated with increased risk of pancreatic cancer. And so for individuals of Black non-Hispanic race, uh, they are 1.4 times more likely to be obese compared to white counterparts. Uh, also diabetes is a major factor that contributes to increased risk for pancreatic cancer. Um, an estimated 16.4% of individuals of Black non-Hispanic race have diabetes compared to 11.9% of individuals uh, of white non-Hispanic race, 14.9% of Asian non-Hispanic race, and 14.7% of Hispanic race. Um, so that increased incidence of diabetes is also associated with an increased risk for um, pancreatic cancer. And lastly, tobacco use is, is an associated factor with increased risk for pancreatic cancer. And while smoking is not different between, the race of smoking is not different between uh, individuals of black and white races, uh, the amount of um, uh, black smokers who consume menthol um, and high tar cigarettes is greater than, than white counterparts. And so menthol and cigarettes has been associated with increased uh, addiction, decreased difficult, sorry, increased difficulty to quit smoking. Uh, these are lifestyle factors that can contribute to increased risk. Additionally, there are some potential biological factors such as genetics, inheritable genetics or, or, somatic, or um, somatic acquired mutations that are also associated with um, potential increased risk in pancreatic cancer. One known uh, germline mutation, so something that's inheritable, is a uh, is our uh, variants known uh, as 400G to A or uh, this deletion, which I, I won't name here, um, in, in a gene called CDKN2A, which is cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitor 2A. Uh, these variants are found more frequently in African Americans and are associated with a risk of increased risk of pancreatic cancer. In addition, there are mutations within a tumor uh, during the development of the tumor, and it was demonstrated in a study at uh, Wayne State University that um, tumors from Black patients have a higher uh, frequency of a particular type of mutation in, a, in an oncogene called KRAS. Uh, there, at the position 12 in this, in this gene, uh, there's a common uh, mutation that occurs where a glycine, a G uh, residue, is, is mutated and changed to an, another residue. In, in African Americans, it was found that in this study that uh, those that mutation is frequently changed to a valine, and whether or not that contributes to increased 
disparities uh, experienced by Black patients is yet unknown and requires more 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 study. Additionally, there are um, there is a uh, genetic variant in a gene called uh, SSTR5 or somatostatin receptor 5 um, that is associated with more aggressive uh, phenotype of pancreatic cancer. And this uh, more aggressive phenotype is found more likely uh, in African-American patients than in, uh, in white and Hispanic patients. Uh, so that's what we know about the her hereditability of, uh, of cancer and, and linked biological factors. And lastly, another con contribution that plays a major part in um, increased risk and, um, and mortality and, um, and uh, treatment options is, is healthcare. Uh, a, a large study of 14,000 uh, individuals of pancreatic cancer in, in this SEER uh, registry identified uh, from 1991 to, to 2002, identified that Blacks uh, were less likely to see a medical oncologist uh, about their pancreatic cancer uh, than, than, than white patients, uh, less likely to see a radiation oncologist, and less likely to see a surgeon. Uh, so that suggests that uh, Black patients are less likely to, um, to seek and acquire uh, care. Um, other studies have demonstrated that uh, they're less likely to be referred to a, uh, a specialist oncologist. Um, and, and some of these uh, are thought to be, uh, thought to involve poor access to um, quality medical institutions, um, lack of, lack or insufficient insurance coverage um, to pay for treatment options. Um, those are potential social contributions to racial disparities. But it's also noted that there is potential implicit bias that comes from the medical community. Uh, when, when interacting with patients of color or patients of uh, different racial or ethnic uh, backgrounds. And there's one reason why many uh, investigators uh, are, uh, sorry, why, why many are interested in the idea of representation. Um, uh, increasing the diversity of the medical and research workforce. Um, in terms of insurance coverage, uh, one study at the uh, in the state of Massachusetts after the passage of um, after the expansion of, insur of insurance coverage in 2006, uh, a plan called uh, that was also known as Romney Care, uh, saw that the rate of pancreatic cancer surgery uh, increased by 67 percent in that state after the insurance expansion, uh, and that was compared to flatline, flatline um, changes in rates to uh, three other control states, suggesting that, that uh, access to insurance, uh, access to uh, coverage of medical treatment is a really critical portion, part that can determine treatment options and, and potentially outcomes. Um, patients, when you um, uh, control for whether or not, whether we control for whether or not a patient um, did receive treatment, um, there there is less difference in the in in the outcomes of black and white patients. So quality care is really important, and how patients get quality care uh, becomes the obstacle. Another thing um, that plays a role in health equity is our lack of information about um, the diseases that specifically affect or, or um, may more aggressively affect racial and ethnic populations. Uh, and that brings up a really important topic is clinical trial participation. Clinical trials are one way that we learn a lot of information about new treatment options, uh, the effects of those new treatment options, as well as um, acquire research samples in order to, to identify some of the genetic factors that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we, in the research field, lack a diverse representation of research tools. Uh, and those tools generally involve biological samples. Um, we in the lab grow, uh, some people say grow in petri dishes, um, tissue that is um, derived from human cancers. Uh, we call these 
these tissues now that they, we propagate them in a laboratory, a cell line. Uh, so we have many different types of cancer cell lines, but notably most of those cancer cell lines come from majority populations. So they're, they're not uh, from uh, ethnic or racial minority populations. And so it gives us really a, a, a small window to, to understand what might be happening in a more uh, um, aggressive type of tumor if, if we can identify those in patients with in patients of racial and ethnic minorities. Uh, I, I pointed out from the left a paper that um, I, I mentioned earlier when I was talking about the somatostatin-5 um, variant um, that leads to increased aggressiveness of, of pancreatic cancer. Um, the research is in this paper published, and this is not uncommon to find in papers all, uh, or in, in papers that are researching uh, health disparities of pancreatic cancer that uh, if you can read here with me in the highlighted, barriers to progress include low minority inclusion in research studies. And so there's um, research in inclusion of minorities in the clinical trials involves uh, many different factors. Um, some is, is the willingness to participate from the patient. Some is also the, um, the how aggressively or how, um, how hard investigators pursue uh, diverse inclusive representation in their trials. Um, and, and some of that can include implicit biases from the, cl the clinical or scientific researchers. The African Americans make up about 13% of the U.S. population, but participation in cancer clinical trials is very low. It's only about 5%. Of um, the 28 cancer drugs that were FDA approved in 2018 and 2019, there were 8,700 people that participated in those clinical trials uh, that led to that that led to the under, the, un, the research that um, that provided the FDA with enough data for, for approval, only 4% of those participants were black. And so that is a factor that uh, is something we should target and try to increase. And how do we how do we increase? Well, what are the barriers to participation? Or actually, what are the benefits? We know that clinical trials are important studies uh, that contribute to the development of new treatments for diseases. Uh, they also help us understand uh, disease, uh, get access to, to human clinical samples, um, and, and provide and, and perform large statistical studies uh, to, to um, confidently understand what may be happening. Participation in clinical trials can potentially also benefit individual patients um, because it provides them with access to promising state-of-the-art treatments that are not available outside of the clinical trial and wouldn't be available until uh, those, those treatments are FDA approved, if they are FDA approved. Uh, and that's a long process. And so a patient who um, is not responding well to uh, standard of care um, treatments for pancreatic cancer should pursue a clinical trial, uh, and, and especially uh, ethnic and racial minorities, because there's such a low percentage of participation in these trials, and because the incidence and mortality uh, is of this group outweighs those of the other groups, and so this this is this diverse representation is necessary. It also helps us assess whether there are ethnic and racial differences to a drug's safety or effect. Um, we know that there are drugs that do not work in um, certain racial ethnic groups, and that's really based on uh, genetics and heritability. Um, and there are other drugs that have been FDA approved specifically for racial ethnic, group, uh, ethnic groups. Um, only through diverse clinical trials can we really understand uh, these differences. But I will point out that uh, clinical trials investigate experimental treatments. And with that, there is an inclusion of risks. Uh, and so uh, those risks could be unpleasant, they could be serious, and they could be life-threatening. So they, these are serious conversations that must be um, carefully thought about. And um, there are ways in which um, investigators who are, who are studying how to increase the diversity of clinical trials um, are, are strategizing uh, that to, to improve diversity here. So what are some of the barriers to participation? Well, as I mentioned before, there's just some distrust of the medical community, and that's really based on historical um, um, mistreatments um, and ethical activities, um, like the Tuskegee syphilis study. Uh, this also 
potential implicit bias of clinical of clinical researchers and staff. Um, and one one um, mentor of mine uh, says that if you are human, you are biased. You have bias, and so it's important that we understand our bias um, and and uh, attempt to to rectify and um, decrease uh, those biases. Um, there are also routine costs that are involved in clinical trials um, that, that don't involve the experimental treatment, but it may involve a hospital stay and the associated costs of those stays, of those additional um, uh, activities uh, that, that can be um, limiting for participation in a clinical trial, as well as navigating the complicated information about what trials are available, how with, which ones apply to me, um, am I, do I fit the inclusion criteria or exclusion criteria? And so there, there's some uh, solutions that I'll provide on the right side, uh, a way so we can, that we can uh, address that. And lastly, um, transportation to medical centers can also be an important limiting factor. So some solutions to um, overcoming distrust is that we have scientific and medical awareness talks. So talks like this. Um, also um, diversity implicit bias training. I, I think over the last year, many institutions have started to incorporate this into their um, uh, standard trainings. Uh, I, I know my institution certainly has. Um, we, we know that Medicaid will soon start to cover some of the routine costs of clinical trials uh, for Medicaid beneficiaries. It starts in January 2022, so that will help overcome some of those routine costs. Um, increasing access. In addition, the use of patient navigators can, um, patient navigators can help to explain clinical trials to, to patients, help, um, help patients navigate which trials are applicable to them, um, and, and instituting a routine checklist for oncologists that whenever a patient meets with their oncologist, uh, they're regularly checked for trial eligibility, um, understanding that clinical trials may be a patient's best option for, for success and remission. Um, the um, use of either Medicaid's non-emergency medical transportation benefit or partnership with transportation companies can significantly improve the access to a clinical trial, um, as well as some, some federal requirements that um, require all clinical trials report race and ethnic um, uh, diversity within their trials, as well as expectations for clinical trials to have diverse trial representation. Um, and I'm, I'm going to give one example of my own cancer center where I am at the Abramson Cancer Center at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, this was, this was um, recently reported at ASCO, which is the American Society for Clinical Oncology. Um, this is about how community outreach engagement can improve clinical trial participation. And so uh, in 2014, uh, Black residents, which comprise 19% of the population of our cancer center's catchment area, uh, and 16.5% of cancer cases in our catchment area, area um, only 11.1% of our cancer patients were Black. So, so there's an underrepresentation of that population at our in the, at our cancer center um, in 2014. And those Black patients that were participating in clinical trials, uh, treatment clinical trials, non-therapeutic interventions, or non-interventional trials were 12.2%, 8.3%, and 13% respectively. Uh, also lower than the uh, percent of uh, Black cancer patients in, in the catchment area. And so what the Cancer Center did in 2014 was establish a, a center-wide program with community guidance to address these, these gaps. Uh, those elements included culturally tailored marketing strategies for clinical cancer clinical trials, plans for each protocol to facilitate Black participant enrollment. Uh, so this is active work here. Um, actively doing the work. Uh, new, new partnerships with faith-based faith organizations serving Black communities to conduct educational events about clinical trials, pilot programs with transportation companies like Lyft and Ride Health to address transportation barriers, um, setting up patients with nurse navigators to, to provide education regarding cancer and clinical trials, and then uh, an improved informed consent process to be sure that the patients are knowledgeable about the types of, of trials that they are, are signing up for. And then in 2018, 
uh, so five years after this pro program had begun, the percent of Black patients that were seen at the, our cancer center had risen to 16.2%, which matches the percent of Black cancer patients in the catchment area, 16.5. Uh, the total cancer clinical trial accrual had increased, uh, a 41.5% increase, and Black patients that were participating in treatment, non-therapeutic, and interventional clinical trials had increased to 23.9%, 33.1%, and 22.5%. And so this type of um, community outreach and engagement uh, at, at this cancer center provides a roadmap for how, how we do this more, um, more nationally and increases representation. Uh, now, the next topic that I, I will discuss um, is, is one that's near and dear to my heart, but I had to introduce a, a, another topic, another definition. Uh, I may have said it already, but didn't provide a great definition of that. And that's underrepresented minority. This is a term that we use in, um, especially in the STEM or biological um, science, technology, engineering, and math fields uh, to describe individuals from racial and ethnic groups that have been shown by the National Science Foundation to be underrepresented in health-related sciences on a national basis. And so that includes Blacks or African-Americans, Hispanics or Latinos, Af American Indians or Alaskan Native, Native Hawaiians, and other Pacific Islanders. Uh, and so the topic that I want to discuss here is uh, the oncology workforce and also the, the biological, medical, and research workforce. Um, so we know that Black people uh, comprise about 13% of the U.S. population. Um, and that number decreases when you look at recent college graduates um, and recent medical uh, school applicants, medical school graduates, um, the percent of, of uh, medical school graduates that go on to be residency, it's actually the same. Uh, and those, the percent of those uh, residents who go on to become oncology fellows and those that go on to become oncology. Um, and so there's, there's a decrease in the frequency of African-Americans at each one of these stage. Uh, we think of this um, in the area of workforce diversity and development as a pipeline. Uh, I will mention that uh, we're thinking about this in current day, but it's important to remember the historical context of African-American experiences in this country because it's a contribution to our current day diversity. Uh, and so I just want to remind us that exclusion of African-Americans from higher education was standard practice in the United States until, until fairly recently, fairly recently like the end of the civil rights movement. Um, this is a, a letter from the director of admissions to uh, uh, at that time, Mr. Marion Gerald Hood, who's now Dr. Marion Gerald Hood, who's an, an OBGYN who lives in, in uh, Georgia. But at this time, Mr. Hood was applying for medical school at Emory University, and he was denied admission to medical school. And I want you to just see that second sentence here. I'm sorry that I must write that we are not authorized to consider admission uh, for admission a member of the Negro race. Um, and then they returned his $5 application fee to medical school. So this is common practice. Uh, exclusionary practice practices uh, prevented African-Americans from joining the medical workforce, from, uh, from obtaining PhDs in, in science, from performing the research that uh, we're all interested in now uh, and, and hoping will lead to, to more and more treatments. Uh, and I think when thinking about this exclusionary practice, and, uh, and what has been, uh, I think, a, a difficult experience for African-Americans to date uh, in this country that I, I think of Newton's third law of motion, uh, which is a, a physics principle. And that's for every action in, in nature, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And I think that that equal and opposite reaction requires us to, to make that equal and opposite reaction. And there, I think there's a need for innovative, disruptive ideas that can challenge the status quo for workforce diversity with explicitly inclusive policies and intentions. Uh, and, I, and I'll talk about some of those um, as, I, as I proceed. I mentioned that we think of workforce diversity in terms of a pipeline, that uh, um, there is a percentage of uh, individuals, and it's really youth, in the, in the US population that go on to college, um, but then 
uh, those that end up making it to uh, positions in academia or in industry, um, developing uh, drugs for pancreatic cancer or working in oncology uh, diminishes over time. And we want to know where are those leaks happening? Where are people leaving the, the, the pipeline? Where are they leaving the workforce? And we know that, that some of that happens um, during college, um, that people leave college. Um, some of that happens in the process from college to graduate school uh, and, and, uh, and then the next steps in uh, postgraduate training and then finally leading to small frequencies of, of Black individuals who uh, enter into faculty positions in, in, uh, in our country. Um, so I laid out here for you what a career path for a scientist looks like, and then below it, what a career path for a physician looks like. And so up top, that's, that's the path that I took. Um, first, we start with early education, pre-kindergarten through high school. Um, this is really shaping, shaping your education. Uh, I'm not going to speak on this, but this is probably the most critical por portion, portion of, of career development is, is um, quality education, uh, encouraging uh, and enriching students' minds um, with excitement towards pursuing some career path. Uh, and then students enter into college. Uh, and there in college, that's, that's really your first introduction to biomedical research. Um, you, will, you may participate in academic year or summer research. Uh, academic year, if you're in the institution that you are attending, has the, has the opportunity to provide you with research experiences. Not all um, colleges have research laboratories where students can conduct uh, independent and innovative research. Um, and so some students re rely on summers to acquire that, uh, that experience. Uh, I will note that the next step here uh, in going from college to graduate school, research experiences is one of the most important factors for admission. Uh, I sit in admissions at uh, in my institution, and uh, your academics, your GPA, your research experiences um, at, are, are critical to, to you, your being admitted to the next step. Um, and in, in, at this stage in a scientist's career, um, you're taking general science coursework, so things like cell biology, organic chemistry. You're not yet specializing in a certain area. Barriers to success here are, are really barriers to entry. Um, cost of tuition is expensive. And so if we look at the US News and World Report for number one college, all the way down to what's tied for number 49 with three other colleges, they're around 53 to $64,000 a year. That's a very uh, steep price for, um, uh, especially for low income individuals. Uh, and that is a barrier to, to access. Um, additionally, there can often be lack of academic support systems. Uh, that's one reason why students leave the workforce. And there, there are many other options. This is, this is a very complicated, um, complicated matter. Um, to the right, I have uh, um, a graphic that explains or, or demonstrates the both the percent of underrepresented minorities that earn bachelor's degrees uh, in sciences in the, uh, in the uh, United States, 18% um, at, at, at 2013, uh, as well as a, uh, a graphic that demonstrates the number of, of uh, bachelor's earned by um, individuals of each different um, race or ethnic group uh, identify here. So you can you can tell this orange bar of underrepresented minorities, which includes African Americans, Hispanic Americans, Native and Native Americans, uh, Alaska Natives, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. Um, that percent has increased over time. The size of the orange bar has increased over time. So progress has is being made. Uh, the next step to uh, and that career path is admission to graduate school. And so here there's, there's an application process um, that um, many schools still require standardized testing. That sometimes can be thought of as a barrier to entry. Uh, this is a time in which uh, PhD students do five to six years of intensive independent academic research. They end up writing uh, a thesis 
uh, I actually was looking at my thesis, uh, which I completed 11 years ago uh, in February. Um, I was looking at it recently when talking to a group of um, undergrads who have interest in, in attending graduate school. Um, uh, and at this point, students do field specific coursework. So they're going to specialize and take courses in cancer biology or immunology, and they're going to learn about microbes and viruses. Um, typically, you have one main advisor, but then you may have three or four other members of an advisement committee. And it's this group of individuals who are responsible for not only supporting you through your graduate training, um, providing you guidance, um, but also they make the decision on when you are done. So that five to six years is it's actually kind of open-ended. Uh, and once you meet the criteria that that committee has set for you, uh, then, then you, you can graduate or they, they allow you to graduate. At this stage, there's often lower diversity. It's lower, lower amounts of underrepresented minorities that are in graduate school. And so a need for a support system is often common amongst underrepresented minority graduate students. Um, the need to be able to talk to someone that you can identify with, where you can talk about um, uh, problems that you, you don't feel comfortable talking about to general public uh, or, or to majority population. And this is, this is common. Um, and as you will note, that orange bar is much smaller uh, in this group. So the number of um, underrepresented minorities who achieve PhDs or awarded PhDs every year has shrinking, has, has shrunk, uh, and is a smaller, smaller proportion. The next step after graduate school, um, after achieving a PhD, in most cases for, for doing an academic uh, career, is a postdoctoral fellowship. And so this is a, something that can be more open-ended. It's typically up to five years, although some institutions allow a postdoctoral fellowship to continue perpetually. Um, this is independent research that a post a PhD now performs in a different research laboratory generally, uh, sometimes on a different research topic. And uh, it provides training towards being able to run your own academic lab. Um, this, at this point, this is where most people solidify their research topic. And so for finding investigators, early stage investigators who are gonna be interested in pancreatic cancer, this is uh, the stage at which that gets that really gets solidified. Um, there are metrics of success in this uh, in this group. Publications, funding acquisition is really important, um, and uh, there's also lower diversity here than in graduate school. And I have two graphics below that that show the uh, percent of underrepresented. Um, residents and fellows in oncology over time and how that has stayed flatline uh, despite other groups rising in uh in frequency so for his, hispanics um th uh, this number has has risen and and has fallen over time and then the the um, frequency of underrepresented minority uh, postdocs is also very small when compared to non-underrepresented minority and and note when I say underrepresented minority, I'm talking about the six, six different groups that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and then lastly, the last step after a postdoc is generally that uh, these individuals apply for uh, faculty positions. And faculty has um, different stages. There's assistant professor and then associate professor and then full professor. And here their success metrics uh, are quality scholarship, so publications, uh, acquiring funding, um, which means grant writing uh, and, and success on, on those grants, acquiring those grants, um, teaching performance, uh, developing a national reputation, and then performing service uh, to your university. And if you look at the graphic to your left, uh, all the way to the left, you'll see that while there's been increases in the numbers of underrepresented minorities uh, over the last, uh, over this, this decade or so that's presented here, uh, and obtaining a, a bachelor's degree and obtaining a PhD uh, um, uh, and, and completing a postdoc, uh, there has been flat line um, uh, increase. There has been no change in the amount of, of full professor faculty. So at some point in, in this pipeline, um, those increased numbers aren't translating uh, to the next level. Uh, and, and 
at that this stage faculty level, this is where um, new trainees, the next generation of scientists are going to be trained. Uh, it's also where um, research will start on new drug development. So faculty start bringing in new ideas, starting clinical trials, as I mentioned, uh, my lab has one I'm currently running, and, and not making it to that stage or not making it uh, or somehow falling out of the pipeline after that stage and not making it to the full professor stage is really a disservice to all of us um, because it, it means that we may lack um, advances that are uh, that could be potential potentially effective. Uh, below I have uh, a, a graphic that shows um, the frequency, uh, the percent of um, faculty by race, uh, junior faculty and senior faculty, and you can see that there's a very there's no difference in STEM fields uh, of black junior faculty and senior faculty. The number is around three to four percent, um, and in for non STEM fields that's different. So so in the biological sciences and in STEM fields uh, we have some work to do. And then one of those metrics, success measures I mentioned, is funding acquisition. There was a, a, a highly cited and important paper in 2011 that reviewed uh, our National Institutes of Health. Um, it reviewed the amounts of uh, funding uh, for a, a, the most, um, for a grant called the R01, which is, which is a grant for independent research scientists, and it's a well-respected grant. Um, the percent of African Americans who receive this award, the probability of receiving this award, is about 12 to 13 percent lower when compared to uh, other ethnic groups, and that's when controlling for education, institution, research type, um, and so that suggests that there may be other factors, uh, including bias of the review panels, um, in, in terms of grant funding, and when these metrics uh, can't be achieved, uh, that limits the transition from assistant professor to associate professor to full professor. Uh, and so, so interventions uh, to improve that are, are necessary. And speaking of interventions, um, a friend of mine who I went to college with, Kenneth Gibbs, who's now, um, he now works at the National Institute of uh, General Medical Sciences at the NIH, uh, had published this important paper in um, 2016. Uh, and, and here, uh, what Kenny did was he went around the country and he talked to um, faculty, uh, he talked to postdocs, he talked to PhD students, uh, and he also looked at the numbers of PhD graduates from underrepresented uh, minority backgrounds from 1980 to 2013. And he saw that, that those numbers increased by a factor of 9.3 compared to a 2.3 fold increase in the number of PhD graduates from well-represented groups. However, the number of scientists from underrepresented minority backgrounds hired at the next level as assistant professors in medical school basic science departments was not related to the number of potential candidates. Whereas for, for well-represented groups, there was a strong correlation between the number of candidates uh, available and those that were hired. Um, and so, so that suggests that there is um, there's a barrier here. And what they did was they, they built and validated a conceptual system dynamics model that, uh, that posited that there's no hiring discrimination. And they found that without institutional or system level intervention, that faculty diversity in our country would not increase significantly through the year 2080. And so if you want to see huge improvements in, in this space and workforce development, uh, workforce diversity, we need to make interventions. Um, and so if, if the number of faculty positions increase or there was increased transitioning of underrepresented postdoc candidates onto the market, um, that would, would improve faculty diversity before 2080. Uh, that suggests that we must be intentional with our mentoring of underrepresented minorities and with our hiring of underrepresented minorities. Um, and so I just want to leave you with a couple strategies to increase workforce diversity, and then I have one plug. Um, uh, so undergraduate research experiences, both summer ac or academic year for underrepresented minorities is important. This is one of the most important factors for admission to graduate school. Um, at the university, at my center, our Center for Cellular Immunotherapies, we've, uh, we have a summer program that just started last year uh, where we have five underrepresented minorities 
in this program working in our in our labs over the summer. They're receiving training specifically in cancer immunotherapy, uh, with hopes that they that will encourage them and uh, and spark. Uh, interest in this field that they'll continue along that path in graduate school uh, and hopefully continue on to a postdoc and faculty position. Uh, I think that culturally sensitive mentoring, such as mentoring circles or pyramids um, of undergrads, graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, and junior faculty is really important. Uh, a postdoctoral fellow in my lab started a program here at the University of Pennsylvania called Mentoring Circles, uh, and it's, it's just that. Uh, she gets together small groups of undergrads, graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, and uh, junior faculty. Each group has this composition, and they're able to mentor each other. Uh, so there's there's some there's some feedback that happens, and that kind of community uh, is important. Uh, additionally, uh, establishing a community of underrepresented minorities on campus can be achieved through uh, faculty cluster talent hiring. Uh, that that can be done in areas in which there is absent or, or not satisfactor, satisfactorily supportive uh, communities. Um, and then funding opportunities for research faculty. Um, so opportunities like the AACR uh, Career Development Award in honor of Congressman uh, uh, John Lewis with the Lust Garden Foundation, that's really important um, because those earmarked awards help uh, underrepresented minorities achieve those metrics that are necessary for success to move to the next level, um, given that there are disparities in how um, other awards are, are received uh, and, and how grants are reviewed, at, and, um, at least at the governmental level. And lastly, I want to give a one shout out. So I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge um, my, my undergrad, the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and the scholarship program that I participated in uh, from 2001 to 2005, the 13th year of that scholarship program. This is a, uh, a program that was started in 1988 with, the, with $5 million of philanthropy from a couple, Robert and Jane Meyerhoff, with the goal was to support African-Americans um, who would work towards obtaining a PhD in STEM fields. Um, and uh, the New York Times has recently um, shown this ad called The Ripple Effect is Real. And um, 33 years later, you can see the you can see and appreciate the ripple effect of this initial investment um, that uh, there's been there's our 13, 1600 participants in this program to date with 1400 alumni, 300 uh, per, uh, scholarship participants that are currently in graduate school programs now. Uh, UMBC is the number one undergrad college for African Americans who will later obtain an MD PhD, and it's the number two undergrad college for African Americans who obtain PhDs in science and engineering. And then I highlighted uh, three of my uh, favorite people below. Uh, this is Dr. Kizmekia Corbett, who hopefully everyone knows by now. Uh, she's had a great year. She is an NIH scientist who's responsible for, for the development of the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, her work in coronavirus vaccines has uh, definitely predated this pandemic, uh, but it's, it's important to see that her contributions have made a significant impact uh, in, in our recovery from the pandemic. She will soon become an assistant professor at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, uh, so very excited for her. Uh, the next, my, my frat brother, uh, Kafi Draza, who, like, like we do, um, is in this picture having a conversation with a, with the former president at this time he was uh, uh, Barack Obama was president. Uh, Duke is is an associate. Uh, sorry, Kafi Kafui Trasa is an associate professor of psychiatry at Duke University School of Medicine. And lastly, my uh, really good friend Kyla McMullen, uh, who is an assistant professor of computer science at the University of Florida. She was the first Black woman to receive a PhD in computer science from the University of Michigan. Uh, these are three that I highlighted because they're some of my favorite people. Um, but this program has been highly successful. And, um, and I think that that ripple effect that I've discussed uh, continues. Um, I, I know in my own lab, I have had a high frequency of underrepresented minorities who come to my lab, who would like to work in my lab to, to be trained. And I think that that uh, investment in, um, and training a very diverse workforce is something that this program initiated and, and helps perpetuate. 
Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I know that there were some questions that came up. I did not see any of them, um, but I'm going to stop my share now and hopefully we can have that discussion. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Posey, for that excellent talk and great overview of academia and what it take, what it's going to take to develop a more diverse workforce and the work that's already been done. So great talk. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Do you do you want me to read the questions to you? Do you want to? I'm I'm reading some of the questions. Okay, now. great. <laughs> um, so I guess I can go in order. Um, does the uh, less likely to receive um, actually see a uh, specialist? Does that mean that um, blacks are are less likely to seek care for pancreatic cancer? Sometimes some studies have shown that this this is indeed the case that um, black are black individuals are less likely to seek care uh, for their treatment and if they and if they have seen a specialist are also less likely to um, to decide to take that care um, so I think that this is complicated <laughs> uh, it, in, it involves medical distress um, it's it's a I think it also um, is a is a feature that's not unique to um, to African Americans. I know that other minority communities also are less likely to seek uh, active care. Um, sometimes that's well, definitely is to detriment to seek uh, quality and preventive care, um, and only some only go to the doctor when it's uh, a dire need that's that's indeed a problem and that definitely affects your next question which is about the time of diagnosis definitely um, preventive care early screenings are important because that helps identify if there are problems that that could be caught and treated and early treatment is um, the best option early catching uh, any diagnosis especially for pancreatic cancer is the best option um, and it provides you with the most treatment potential treatment options, which should be should be highly considered. Um, but but probably also there needs to be, uh, as I mentioned, like a patient navigator, someone that that clearly and um, that takes time to clearly explain options, um, options and potential outcomes and and what other things to expect. Um, could other solutions be trying to open clinical trials at satellite sites, sites in the community rather than at big hospital centers? I think that's definitely uh, something that should be should be considered. Um, it's often complicated. Um, I don't have a great answer for that. Okay. <laughs> the next is a great question. The outcomes from your community outreach and engagement program are great. I, I want to say that that's not my work, but uh, others at, at Penn, our, our cancer center director, Bob Vonderheide, and um, and our one of our uh, associated directors, Carmen uh, Guerra, excellent work. Have other cancer centers replicated or reached out to you to get your roadmap? Actually, I think that that, that communication between cancer centers is currently happening. Um, I am a middle school teacher of Black scholars. My mission is to diversify the STEM fields on both ends to provide encouragement, opportunities, and skills for my scholars, and also work to make the fields more welcoming and accessible. I'm glad I came today. So thanks for your excellent presented data. Thank you. Perspective and potential solutions. Do you have any specific advice or thoughts for me or my scholars? Mm. That's a great question. Um, I think that um, advice would be find community. Um, I think that one of the one of the things that, it, at least in, in my mind, that limits someone's someone seeing their full potential in a field is a feeling of isolation. Um, that if you don't see someone who looks like you in the role that you're trying to attain, it makes it difficult to picture yourself there. Um, but um, what, what I benefited from, at least in the scholarship program that I was in, was a community of people who are all attempting to do the same thing. Um, and so we were very good at finding communities for, um, for anything that we have interest in. And so I think find a community of people who are, in, who are like you, who might share demographics or share um, share uh, uh, race or other characteristics like you, 
as well as have similar interests and, and keep strong bonds between that community. That's really important, um, I, I believe. Thank you, Dr. Posey. Community is power and research is fundamental. And we're so honored to have you as the inaugural awardee of the John Lewis Award and the John Lewis Career Development Award. So thank you, thank you for this excellent talk. And thanks again to Bristol Myers Squibb for your sponsorship. And this video, this webinar will be posted on our YouTube channel. And Dr. Posey, we can't wait to watch you follow your career and see all the great things that uh, you will bring to the field of pancreatic cancer research. We know we need more options, more treatments, and we're really looking forward to all, the, all of your great future work. Thank, Thank you. you, Dr. Posey, and thanks to the Lost Garden community for tuning in, and we'll hopefully we'll see you all on June 30th at the next Lust Garden Live. Thanks, everyone. Happy Friday and happy Juneteenth. Thank you. Bye.